for free, where you can turn on the skeletal system, the nervous system, and so on. You can click on things to remove them. And I, I was able to create this image of the relationship between my kidney and the psoas muscle. Uh, and then rotate it in 3D. You know, look through. Say, and, and I thought, what the heck? You know, we've got Google Earth where you can fly to Duluth and go to an individual building. Why not Google Earth for my body? And this is a generic body. Now, but it's not hard to imagine that we take my scan image, which is currently a crummy black and white low resolution thing, and mash that up with this. So we're actually looking at my body and seeing my body in 3D. And I can tell you from a visceral level, I have a different relationship to what's going on inside me given this awareness of where the pieces are. This is, the, uh, uh, this is the article from this week from Health Leaders Magazine that Gunther mentioned. Uh, you can see this online. I, it, I just, I've got it here because I just love the vision that the woman articulated, Jana Shaw. She, she was new to this whole subject, but she completely got it. Patient enters the waiting room and is greeted by her personal navigator who hands her a tablet-sized computer. In his office, the physician is reading an email from a patient who's forwarded an interesting study. There was a great moment um, almost two years ago where I was waiting for a CAT scan follow-up visit in the doctor's office. And while I was waiting, I was on the computer doing some stuff. And then the oncologist and the nurse practitioners came in. And a few minutes later, uh, my wife cracked up. She was sitting there. She said, what's wrong with this picture? Because I was sitting there pointing something out on the computer while the oncologist sat on the examining table and the nurse practitioners were writing down the URL. It's a new world, people, completely new world. So that's the vision. Where are we today? I went to move my data into an online PHR. Gunther, how are we doing on time? I'm running long, aren't I? Good, good. So I punched the button to move my data into Google Health, and I got this craziness. I got this false medication warning saying that my blood pressure medication conflicted with low potassium in my blood. Well, low potassium in my blood was true when I was in the hospital being treated for the cancer. It was not, true, not accurate. Plus, there was a whole bunch of things uh, it, in my conditions uh, on the right side. They listed everything I'd ever had with no dates attached to it, which was crazy. We looked into it, and it turns out that what they'd done was they transmitted billing codes instead of clinical data and so from an IT perspective, I mean, it's just goofy to pick up a one type of data just because it happens to be available and use it, even though it's not appropriately modeled for what you're going to do with it. Here's the thing. We, it's a long story. The, you can read the 3,300-word blog post about it on epatients.net if you want. I have to say that both the hospital and Google Health responded in an exemplary way. Uh, they com completely disclosed everything. Well, once it hit the front page of the Boston Globe, they responded in an exemplary way. The, uh, but the, I got a, a complete Excel spreadsheet of every billing record that the hospital had for me, and I went through and added notes on the left, and my physician went through and added notes on the right. And we have some crazy things, like the top note on the right points to an item that's it's 424.2, non-rheumatoid tricuspid valve disease. Well, for one thing, I never had that. And for another thing, that was during a visit where I was getting an infusion to treat my bone met. It is not normal for a cardiac condition to be diagnosed during uh, 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 a, a, uh, an ortho visit. Uh, and let's see, down at the bottom, bone and cartilage disease. Uh, that was during the visit where I went in when the tumor had erupted from my tongue. How that billing code got in there, nobody knows. This is not data that's well managed. And this is at a hospital, by the way, that is well known for being one of the leading ones in, in how they handle IT. Uh, another example in the top right, um, aortic aneurysm. Well, it turns out that on one report, um, I had a, a radiology report showed a one quarter inch enlargement at the base of the aorta. And strictly speaking, that's an aneurysm. Do you know what the trick is? Upcoding. 
you can bill more if there's an aneurysm involved than if there's a slight swelling involved. When I learned about upcoating, I immediately thought about my supermarket, where in the deli section, they have regular bologna, and then they have next to it something that looks awfully similar that's labeled tasty delicious bologna. <laughs> and it's priced higher. So here we have tasty delicious bologna applied to our healthcare costs. And then there are other things like volvulus of the intestine. This is a life-threatening kink in the intestine, which is fatal if you don't fix it in a couple of days. I never had it. How it got in, I don't know. How much of the excess healthcare costs in the US is due to things like this? And nobody can track it down. So physician errors, clerical errors, and upcoding. Here's the thing. HIT, health IT, just needs to follow normal IT best practices. Find the right data vocabulary, right? Uh, use good re reliability practices and test it with real world data before going live. Not rocket science, it is available to us. Here's another risk that nobody talks about. In the US, there is a, uh, an organization called the MIB, the Medical Information Bank. And what it is, is an insurance industry association where insurance companies share what things you've had billing codes submitted for so that you can't hide conditions from them such that they might be harmed by your dishonesty. However, this video from Consumer Reports uh, is about a woman from the Katrina area in Mississippi who lost her 401k savings and everything else. Her, her, uh, she has asthma. Uh, her insurance company would not cover her treatments, and it turns out the root cause was that her physician had accidentally miscoded something, and it took her forever to find that out. The MIB is a private insurance industry data bank. I got in touch with them. They are totally opaque. You cannot find out stuff in there. You are, because they're similar to a credit bureau, you're allowed to get a copy of your records, but as I wrote on the blog, I won't go into it here, good luck really making sense out of it. And their lawyer started writing to me and made clear that they don't consider themselves liable for any damage they cause. So, the lesson, you better check for errors. If you're an American, check into the MIB. So, here's the question. What's in your wallet medically? Do you personally know everything that's in your medical record? Healthdatarights.org published a declaration of health data rights uh, this, uh, this summer. Uh, you can go sign it, endorse it uh, if you want to. At Health Camp Toronto yesterday, we had a terrific discussion initiated by Jen McCabe, who will be on later this morning, uh, saying that this isn't tough enough, that one thing that's not stated here is the fundamental thing, this is my data. It is my property. I mean, whose data is it? So we're actually thinking about, uh, about revising that. My endorsement said, look, these rights are as inalienable as the right to life itself. Whose life depends on its accuracy? Whose data is it anyway? My physician, in his endorsement, said, how can patients participate if they can't see the same data? And to wrap up, Clay Shirky is a real internet visionary. He, for instance, if you're familiar with the concept of the long tail, which really alters uh, our thinking about finding things on the internet. He's one of the originators of that idea. And on the subject of data sharing, he said, giving patients access to their medical records will naturally improve the quality of what's in there. And I love the way he said it. You clean up when you know company's coming. When you know somebody's gonna be looking at the data. And he also pointed out the opposite model, clean then share, never works out because it turns out, well, we can't share it yet because we haven't cleaned it yet. And meanwhile, lives are at stake, people, right? So, and then finally, Gunther talked about Medicine 1.0, Medicine 2.0. We had Web 1.0, which was publish only. Web 2.0 is read write. Right? We can put things out on the web. We can share information with each other. No less an authority than Tim Berners-Lee, considered the founder of the web, gave a talk at TED Talks this spring where he talked about what's next for the internet. And it's beyond anything I had realized. It's not just aggregating similar public pieces of published data. He's talking about now intelligent agent software that can go out and derive new information, create new knowledge, 
but 